Baptists, American Presbyterians were deeply divided and their division persisted for decades. In the debates that took place, especially at the judicatories, presbyteries, synods, and eventually the General Assembly, the opponents of slavery tended to get the upper hand, but they struggled mightily to work out some kind of compromise with those who were the defenders of slavery. And they worked and worked and worked at that, but ultimately uh, it failed. And the result was division, several divisions, several schisms, uh, leading up to the big schism, which took place at the time of the Civil War uh, and the creation of something called the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States, the predecessor to what became the Southern Presbyterian Church, the PCUS. So today we're going to talk about the sequel to that, which is the era of segregation. But before I get into that, I want briefly to comment on one question that was posed to me in an email exchange this past week. I had email exchanges with several people in this group about uh, things that were discussed in the session. One issue that was raised uh, by John Cluett, I think it's just worth mentioning very quickly. I said in the presentation last week that there erupted in the latter part of the 18th century a great debate, not just in the United States, but elsewhere about the legitimacy of slavery. And his first question to me was, did I get that right? And the answer is yes, uh, you got it right. And the fascinating thing is that, that the background to that is that there was not much debate about the legitimacy of slavery in Western culture generally up until that time. So the obvious question is, why then? And of course, that's a fascinating and to some extent mysterious issue. Uh, I would uh, answer it very simply in the following way. I think what happens in the, in the latter part of the 18th century is that enlightenment ideas, we hold these truths to be self-evident and all that kind of thing, become very popular in the Western world. And they have obvious implications for challenging, calling into question the legitimacy of slavery. And that had an effect upon all kinds of different other bodies of thought, including Christianity. And Christians, uh, you might say, were awakened to the evil of slavery in a way that they had not been for centuries. With that uh, as background, let me now go to talk about uh, today's topic. The successor to slavery is, uh, in American life, uh, a regime uh, called segregation. And I'm going to give you some dates, uh, roughly the 1880s through the 1950s. And I date it that way because during that period, you have a set of institutions and practices and beliefs whose legitimacy was accepted, largely accepted. The legitimacy of this was accepted. And of course, I'm talking here about whites. I'm not talking about bl blacks who had an altogether different view of it. But during that period, the legitimacy uh, of these institutions, practices, and beliefs was largely accepted and in fact codified into law and therefore enforced, enforced by public authorities. In the 1950s and on into the 1960s, you begin to get a, uh, a change of mood in the United States and eventually a change in law, which involves the delegitimation of segregation. I'll talk about that next week. Today, I want to talk about what segregation was very briefly, and then, of course, mainly my main topic, which is the Presbyterian response to it. And the story of the Presbyterian response to it is complicated. I'm going to make a distinction between three different uh, kinds of responses. The response of Black Presbyterians. Secondly, the response of Southern white Presbyterians, or at least the majority of them, it would appear. And then finally, Northern white Presbyterians, and of course by Northern, I mean anything outside of the South, because that's typically the way the issue was framed, the Southerners versus the Northerners. The word segregation has, uh, if you want to interpret it in this way, a kind of innocent sound to it. And I begin there because it's important to understand that there were all kinds of defenses that were of segregation that were mounted, including theological defenses, and including theological defenses by Presbyterians, especially, of course, in the South, but not just in the South. And when the institutions and practices of segregation were defended, typically it was in terms of all we're doing here is separating things that 
should be separated. Indeed, in the theological version, not only separate, not only should be, but that's God's will. It's God's will that these things be kept separate. Now, to put it mildly, that's an ideological way of thinking about segregation for the following reason. It was created by whites. Blacks didn't have any say in it. It was created by whites, and it was imposed on the blacks by the, the, the whites who were involved in this. And it involved, uh, nobody, nobody who's looked at the facts about this, it seems to me, have any, has any doubt about this. It involved the subordination and exploitation of blacks. Segregation was not just separation, it was subordination and exploitation uh, of the target population, which was blacks. Uh, in other words, it was, to some extent, a kind of re-imposition of the sort of thing that had existed in slavery once the institutions of slavery had been outlawed. The blacks, I want to stress, with very few exceptions, resisted it, and when they couldn't, when they couldn't really make much headway in overturning it, they made the best of it, but they disliked it, and they made it very clear that they disliked it, and above all, or maybe not above all, but certainly among the foremost critics of it were black Presbyterian leaders. I'm going to be stressing all the way along in this series of talks the way black Presbyterians thought about these things and the way whites uh, 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 thought about it. But let me stress, uh, this is, again, something that I think is very important to keep in mind as we think about this, even though I'm going to be making this north-south distinction, segregation did not ex exist just in the south. It existed throughout the whole country, uh, even in New England, where it was most stoutly criticized. It existed to some degree, and it had it had existed uh, before uh, the uh, the Civil War. The practices and policies that uh, I'm referring to when I gave you those dates earlier, 1880s to the 1950s, those uh, practices were put in place in the 1880s and the 1890s. And then the early decades of the 20th century, it took several decades for this to unfold, were designed essentially to do the following, to reverse the gains that blacks had achieved in the period of reconstruction. Reconstruction is the thing which comes right after the Civil War, right after the uh, emancipation of slaves. We get a brief period from the black point of view, and we're hearing about it today, a kind of uh, uh, a kind of golden moment uh, when they not only are set free, but also begin to be empowered, especially empowered politically, and begin to assert their desire, not just for civic equality, but social equality and political equality as well. And segregation was clearly designed to reverse most of the gains that had been achieved in that way. Another way to put this would be to say, the point of segregation was to uh, resubordinate the black population, or to put it really crudely, to put them back in their place, to put them back in their place uh, from the point of what was un what the white segregationists believed was the obvious place uh, of the black population. Um, this was, and I think this is the thing that above all you have to have in mind in order to think about this in the way that it's beginning to be thought about again today in American public life. And I will say, I think this is a very good thing. It was not only allowed, but enforced, and, uh, but it was, not only was it accepted, but it was legitimized and enforced by the federal government. Let me say that again. It was not only accepted, but it was endorsed and even enforced by the federal government. And I want to point to three key aspects of that, which are, are just central, it seems to me, to, under, to, to, to understanding why it uh, graded so much on the black population as this unfolded. There's this famous decision. Uh, if you haven't heard about this decision, look it up on the web. It's just worth uh, getting a little glimpse in your mind of what uh, this decision amounted to. You've heard of Plessy versus Ferguson, a famous court decision, Supreme Court decision in 1896. Plessy was a man of mixed race in Louisiana who challenged in the law, uh, the, uh, the laws that were being adopted by the state of, uh, of Louisiana concerning separate ac accommodations uh, in, in public transportation, above all the railroads. And the idea was that it was important for the races to have separate cars, separate, separate railroad cars, and not to, to co-mingle, to intermingle with one another. 
Uh, Plessy challenged this, uh, this mixed race man, on the grounds that it violated equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment, which had just been passed uh, right, after the, right after the Civil War. And then in, the, in a majority decision, not a unanimous decision, the court held that those uh, separate facilities were uh, constitutional, believe it or not. Uh, and we get that famous infamous phrase, as long as they're separate but equal, that's okay. And separate uh, but equal becomes a kind of uh, mantra, if you will, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, statements made by uh, defenders of, of, uh, of, of segregation. I just want to say parenthetically, the reason why that just struck the black population, especially the black leaders, is utterly, uh, uh, utterly false, uh, was that there was nothing equal about it. The, uh, the uh, uh, facilities for uh, the black population were always inferior, and they, they, that, that rippled out into schools and all kinds of other things. Secondly, an extraordinary decision, Williams versus Mississippi in 1899, uh, which uh, gutted uh, all of the political rights that had been given to blacks uh, right after the, um, uh, right after the uh, uh, end of the Civil War. Williams versus Mississippi had to do with things that we're hearing about today, poll taxes, literacy tests, all those things which were introduced in Mississippi in effect to deny what by that point uh, through a constitutional amendment that the black population had been given, that is equal political rights. And in that uh, decision, uh, the Supreme Court said those things too are, were legitimate because uh, they didn't attack any particular group directly. Now, I'm just gonna say parenthetically, you gotta be smoking something in order to take that seriously. But that was, uh, if you will, Supreme Court legitimation of uh, the gutting of uh, the political rights that had been given to Blacks uh, in uh, the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. And then finally, something which hits very close to home for us Presbyterians, an action taken by Woodrow Wilson in 1913. Woodrow Wilson, I want to stress, of course, was arguably the most Presbyterian of all the, the presidents of the United States. He, after all, was the son uh, of a very well-known, a very distinguished Presbyterian clergyman, who'd been for many years in a church in Stanton, Virginia. And by the way, his father then became a very important leader in the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States. He was one of the most important leaders in that, in that church. And clearly, he was a believer in segregation. His father, in fact, rather openly espoused racist views. Now, I don't want to suggest uh, a direct link. Uh, I'm sure all of us uh, uh, think about our relationship to our parents in very complex ways. I don't want to suggest any direct link between Woodrow Wilson's father's views and Woodrow Wilson's own views, except to say the following. Woodrow Wilson pretty clearly in all kinds of actions acted like a racist. Let me just put it that way. And the most important was something which happened in 1913. And this, is, of course, has come to light in a very dramatic way at Princeton and other places as the legacy of Woodrow Wilson has been uh, has been uh, reviewed in, 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 the, in the most recent uh, upheaval on these matters. Woodrow Wilson took the action of resegregating the civil service in 1913. A an act of, from the point of view, it, it lives in infamy in, in the consciousness of, uh, uh, of blacks who know, know anything about the, about the history uh, of, this, uh, 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 of this whole series of things that I'm talking about in uh, in this particular segment of my, uh, of, of my telling of this story. He resegregated the civil service. And the fascinating thing about it is that there was an appeal that was directed to him by Francis Grimke. Uh, Francis Grimke, Grimke is one of those four or five black Presbyterian leaders that I'm gonna be referring to. I referred to uh, 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 Henry Highland Garnett in my previous talk. Here comes another one. These black pastors in, in the history, particularly pastors, not just pastors, but these black pastors in the history of uh, American Presbyterianism, it, it, it seems to me are just terribly important to understand. Grimke uh, had been to Princeton. Uh, he, had, he had a difficulty getting a degree, but he'd been to Princeton, studied at Princeton Seminary, was a learned man. And ultimately, by the way, he became the pastor again of that famous 15th Street Presbyterian Church in DC eventually. Uh, Grimke was a, was a kind of noted figure in the black world. He also played an important role in, 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 the, in the, the creation of the NAACP in which he believed firmly. 
Uh, Grimke was initially an abolitionist and then in the aftermath of the Civil War became a rather fierce opponent of segregation. And he appealed to Woodrow Wilson. There is a letter that uh, is now available through the, through the records. Uh, you can read them online in the Presbyterian Historical Society in which he appealed as a fellow Presbyterian to Woodrow Wilson. And he said, please, Mr. President, you, I appeal to you as a, as a fellow Presbyterian, as a fellow Christian, uh, someone who certainly believes in the same things as you do, I think this is utterly wrong. This is inappropriate. This is not something which should happen. Please, Mr. President, reconsider this. And of course, Wilson did not reconsider it. And I have heard, I've not been able to document this directly, that there was actually a meeting in the, in, in the Oval Office between Wilson and Grimke and a set of black clergy in which they appealed directly to Wilson and Wilson dressed them down, uh, talking to them in a very paternalistic way about the inferiority of blacks and the need to, uh, to segregate the civil service uh, on grounds of the efficiency uh, of, of government. So you get, I hope you see those three things alone, just the things I've just mentioned really constitute a kind of, of fundamental reworking of everything that happened in reconstruction. And then finally, uh, the thing I haven't mentioned, but is a huge part of the story, of course, the informal imposition uh, and, and enforcement of segregation uh, in the South uh, by, and not just in the South, uh, I can come from Ohio, as some of you know, and in the part of Southern Ohio where I live, there clearly was a history of the, uh, the, the Klan. Uh, the Klan imposed uh, informally, uh, the, you might say the rules of segregation through a what can only be appropriately characterized as a reign of terror. Uh, I don't need in a group like this to go into the details, but just think about the lynchings and the bombings and, and on and on to what, strike terror in the hearts of the subordinate population uh, in order to uh, keep them in place. Now, that's a short version of what could be said in sort of describing segregation. Let me now talk about the response of Presbyterians to all of this. One of the fascinating things about this topic is the following. In the period of segregation, there is a flowering of black independent, of independent black Protestant denominations. Let me say that again. In this period, running from the 1880s roughly through the 1950s, there is a, fl a flowering of uh, uh, black Protestant churches and denominations. Uh, these denominations were, uh, I've already talked about the fact that there were black Presbyterians in the North primarily, independent black churches in the North before the Civil War. But in the aftermath of the Civil War, you get a flourishing of what I'm going to characterize as a somewhat different kind of black Protestant religion, above all, Baptist and Methodist. Independent black Methodist and Baptist churches emer emerge. We, probably everybody in this on this call knows to some extent what I'm talking about, the AME Church, the AME Zion Church, the National Baptist Church, all of which were independent black denominations. It's interesting to note that when they were given a chance to have their own churches in the South, especially, they fled the white churches, they fled the white churches, they ran away from them and created these independent denominations. Uh, and by the way, in the main, the white churches in the South abdicated any responsibility for black, for providing, for supporting, let alone uh, sort of directing a black uh, religious life in this period. That had been the pattern in slavery. I've already talked about the worshiping together uh, in the period of slavery. Suddenly you get a dramatic change. And in the South in particular, there is the emergence of these independent black churches. Now, I wanna stress not quite that happened with the Presbyterians. And this is a very interesting wrinkle in this larger story, which people are writing about and talking about a great deal now. And I'm gonna to try to sketch out some of the elements of it. Uh, the Presbyterian story is the following. Presbyter Black Presbyterians never formed a separate denomination. That's one of the more important things I have to, to say today. Black Presbyterians did not form a separate as the Methodists did, as the Baptists did and so forth. They didn't form, and by the way, the same, the same is true of the Anglicans. There wasn't a separate Anglican black denomination. But something analogous to that happened with blacks in the Presbyterian world. And again, this is just a fascinating thing to think about this and see how it has developed. There developed 
primarily, well, exclusively under the uh, under the direction of the what was what was then the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church, the Northern Church, there developed all black presbyteries and synods, all black presbyteries and synods, and they presided over all black Presbyterian churches. So you had de facto segregation within the wider denomination. And they were under the tutelage of this wider white denomination. By the way, I'm gonna provide a little bibliography eventually online there for people who are interested in reading about this. And there is a fascinating document which is available online produced by uh, uh, blacks in our denomination recently on the history of these all black presbyteries and synods. It's just a whole sort of uh, tr treasure trove of information about this uh, particular phenomenon. The one other interesting thing about this though, is you had all black, and by the way, as far as I, we can tell, the, the initiative in creating these, these separate judicatories, all black uh, uh, presbyteries and synods and so forth came as much from the blacks as from the whites. It's very interesting. And of course, that's part of the logic of the, the emergence of these all black denominations. They were a what? A place for independent uh, black initiative to emerge. And, 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 and it was one place in the black experience in the era of segregation where they really could take control of their own life and do their own thing. One qualification to what I've said about the black judicatories, and this to me is just fascinating. The one place where there seemed to be a, uh, uh, I'm tempted to say integrated, but that's too strong. There, there tended to be a different practice was the theological seminaries. Princeton began to have black students. And I'm not talking about blacks who sort of hung around and listened to the lectures informally. That was the pattern in the, in the 1820s. By the 1860s and 70s, Princeton and several other theological seminaries in the North began to have matriculated black students who graduated. And they, of course, then provide, Grimke was one of those people, by the way, provide leadership in, this, in these emerging black uh, uh, adjudicatories. <clears throat> and by the way, they become a vigorous voice in the adjudicatories and eventually the General Assembly against uh, critiquing segregation. Grimke, I've already said, was just an outspoken in his, in his criticism of Wilson. <clears throat> Two broad uh, observations about the black churches uh, in this period. And, and I hope you're seeing here as I talk and you're beginning to imagine, your minds are jumping ahead to Martin Luther King and a whole series of other things. The background to Martin Luther King is, I kid you not, in this period in these churches. Because what emerges in these churches is a whole new and somewhat different kind of Protestant black Christianity. It is initially more populist than uh, much of, uh, uh, much of uh, 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 Protestant experience otherwise. It's influenced by the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, with its strong emphasis on personal salvation, uh, conversion, all of that kind of thing, evangelization, all of that kind of thing. But it also has an edge that is fascinating, a kind of combination of uh, evangelical piety and social justice, the two marching together, if you will because all the way through this period, there is an insistence that there are unjust things happening to us and a, 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 a sort of recurring claim that these unjust things that are happening to us are a violation of God's will for us, but also of the American creed. As I said last week, it's kind of a blend of evangelical piety and civil religion. Now, that's, a quick, cap, a quick summary of the black church uh, uh, in, in this period. Separate black denominations emerging, but then alongside of those black denominations within certain churches, Presbyterians and Anglicans in particular, a kind of black subculture, if you will, uh, that is in its own way separate and a reflection of the ethos of segregation. Now, what about Southern white Presbyterians? <clears throat> the church that evolved out of the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States. Eventually it became the Presbyterian Church in the United States when those uh, Confederate States were accepted back into the Union. In the main, 
and I'm going to maybe do, do violence to a complicated story here, but I think it's fair to say in the main, this was a church that for a long time embraced segregation, racial segregation as a good thing. Indeed, it developed some of its most eloquent leaders were people who developed uh, what can only be characterized as a theology of segregation. A theology of segregation, which was based on the idea that uh, blacks and whites needed to be kept separate. And there was a kind of undercurrent to that, that the blacks were by nature inferior. A theology of segregation. Now, let me just say parenthetically, I think it's harder, and this is going to maybe may sound ironic to you, but I think it's the case. I think it's harder to develop a theology, theological defense of segregation than it is to develop, at least in biblical terms, a theological defense of slavery. Let me say that again. It's harder to develop a theological defense of segregation, if, you're going to, if you just work as Protestants typically do on the basis of the Bible, than a theo theological defense of slavery. <clears throat> Why? It's because the materials in the Bible don't lend themselves very well to a theolo theological defense of the separateness. It's really fascinating. And some of the, ultimately, some of the more, shall we say, influential, especially in the mid to late 20th century, as this drama plays out, preview of coming attractions, uh, some of the more uh, conservative figures in the, in the, in the uh, PCUS concede in sometimes openly or not so openly that the theological defense of this thing they believe in is not easy to pull off. L. Nelson Bell, for example, uh, who was a, uh, the father of Billy Graham's uh, wife, uh, was one of those people. And he said quite flatly, this is, this is harder to do uh, than a defense of slavery. It's, it's a very interesting thing to observe. But in the main, the Southern Church was a church devoted to the proposition that this segregation, this regime of segregation that we now have is at least in keeping with the will of God and maybe providential as well. Um, therefore, that meant segregated religion. Now note, segregated religion did not exist very much in the era of slavery. It is something which was created. The segregated 11 o'clock hour was a creation of this period. The other thing I want to say is there was very, very little outreach to blacks, which is fascinating because in the era of slavery, uh, Southern whites tended to, especially those who had any role in slavery, tended to believe that uh, there was a, a responsibility. They had to supervise black religion for obvious reasons. Uh, I think I alluded to this last time. The black, independent black religion was in principle a dangerous thing. Well, in the era of segregation, they kind of abdicate responsibility, which leads to an opening I'll get to in just a second. I want to say, finally, just to be fair here, there were very, very important exceptions to the generalizations I've just made. There were, I would say, heroic figures in the development of uh, the white uh, response to segregation in the South among Presbyterians in the uh, in the period uh, that I'm talking about here, which is after all a couple of generations. One of my favorites is somebody who comes from our part of the country, Francis Pickens Miller. Uh, indeed, I look upon this man as a kind of a hero. He challenged the bird machine. He was a layman, uh, very, very active in Democratic Party politics in, in, in the period when the bird machine was very, very dominant in Virginia politics. Uh, he uh, eventually ran for governor uh, was defeated, uh, and the and one of the main things that was was uh, uh, was uh, uh, introduced against him was that uh, was that he was soft on on segregation, uh, and he of course was the father of a uh, of a man who eventually ran. Some of us remember him uh, not too long ago. Uh, again, challenging uh, 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 the other side, the Republican side, uh, in, uh, in in a run for the Senate. Uh, uh, Francis Pickens Miller was a kind of heroic figure uh, who just constantly insisted upon the, 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 uh, the, the, the illegitimacy of segregation. And by the way, was active uh, uh, toward the end of his life in the efforts to resist the, the, the Virginia's massive resistance to the desegregation of schools. He was a Presbyterian layman who represented Fairfax County uh, in uh, the state legislature for a long period. So there were those sorts of people, and I could name others, but they were the exceptions in a, in a denomination which was essentially uh, 
accepting, supporting, and holding on to segregation as the right thing. Now, what about Northern whites? <laughs> well, how many hours have we got? Fortunately for you, not, not, not only a few minutes. So I, wanted to, I want to make three points, three basic points about new Northern whites in, uh, in discussing the response to segregation. In the main, I think it has to be said that Northern Presbyterians tacitly accepted segregation as a given. Let me say that again. In the main, Northern Presbyterians, the PCUSA, tacitly accepted segregation as a given. There was nothing comparable in this period to the fierce conflict over slavery that broke out in the, in the period of the late 18th century and on into the early 19th century. Nothing comparable to that. There were people who had doubts about the legitimacy of this, to be sure, but there was nothing like a kind of struggle that went on in the denomination over that period. And let me stress, there was no, in, as far as I can see in the North, no overt theology of segregation, no affirmation of the theological correctness of segregation, but there was little active uh, 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 opposition to it either. So that's the first thing I wanna stress. And I think it's just, to me, it's almost, it, it, it's, it's puzzling given the, 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 the prior history if, if there was such a, if such, such, such a profound struggle over slavery, why wasn't there such a profound struggle over segregation? Uh, there are all kinds of theories about this, but I think one theory, frankly, is that they, they kind of exhausted themselves uh, in, the, in the struggle over slavery and just sort of settled for, uh, within the churches in particular, settled for a kind of accommodation on this. That's the first point I have to make. The second uh, 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 point I have to make is in some tension with that, not contradiction with it. And please do not think of it as contradiction. While there was acceptance of segregation as a fact of life in both the North and the South, let me stress, in both the North and the South, it was a regime which was heavily imposed in the way that uh, uh, actively uh, imposed in the way that I discussed in the previous talk. But in the, in the North, it was it was it was less rigorously uh, enforced, but it was there. I, for example, grew up in a town in which th there were desegregated schools. This is 1950s desegregated schools, and I would mingled in high school with with, with a, a, a rather large black population. But at the same time, there was a black ghetto, and it was very clear that even my black friends they lived in that place, and they were not going to be living in the place that I lived. And I'm sure that was related to redlining and a whole series of other things. And there was not much of a black middle class either. Uh, there were people who were aspiring to the middle class, but not many. On the whole, the assumption was in that industrial town, they're gonna to be working in the mills. At least the, uh, the, the guys are gonna be working in the mills. And that's kind of a, a, I think it's a sort of a, 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 and by the way, we, even though the church that I attended was right on the, on the, on the, on the edge of that ghetto, there was never a black person in that church except as a janitor. It's very, very sort of, it's, it's sort of complicated codes there at, at, at work. Now, my next point is, in spite of the acceptance of segregation in that way, there was a vigorous effort on the part of Northern whites, Presbyterians, to address the problem of the lack of education for blacks in the South. Indeed, the South was declared by the PCUSA as a mission field. The South was declared as, uh, as a mission field. And of course, it wasn't the whites they were talking about, it was the blacks. And so you have this elaborate thing, which was created, and by the way, this is a kind of ecumenical effort. There was something called the American Missionary Society, which was made up of representatives of the mainline denominations. And they sent, uh, from the Southern point of view, armies, it wasn't really armies, but armies of people into the South to what? Provide educational opportunity for Blacks. And by the way, in that document to which I referred earlier, created by Black Presbyterians, they acknowledge this as a terribly valuable contribution to the development of the Black uh, life in, in the United States in this period. Why? 
Because after the Civil War, even though the federal government had initially assumed some responsibility for providing educational opportunity for blacks, they'd done a very, very modest job of it. And, and that faded in the era after Reconstruction. And what steps into this breach are all of these missionaries who come down there to create schools of various different kinds, ranging all the way from uh, uh, elementary schools all the way up to the beginning of schools of higher education. And by the way, many of the hist historically black institutions come from pr precisely that period. The big Presbyterian contribution is an institution called Johnson C. Smith. Uh, they're, they're in North Carolina, but you know, the whole series of other ones, a whole long list that were created by different kinds of Protestant missionaries, quote unquote, white missionaries going into the South. And by the way, the response to that on the part of the black community generally was overwhelmingly positive. And so in a fascinating way, within a relatively brief period, within a few decades, black literacy rises dramatically countering a claim which was so often made by, if I can just be blunt here, racist, that blacks were not up to serious learning. Uh, they, they responded very favorably to this and the result was a growth in not just uh, the, uh, they might say the rudimentary literacy that people need, but all kinds of higher literacy as well. And you begin to get, this is one of the sources, especially these schools that begin to become colleges and later universities, a very important source of the black middle class, of the professional class, of people who are educators, physicians, lawyers, and of course, clergy. Uh, just a side note on this, many of the people uh, who I don't have numbers here, but uh, certainly there is enough uh, numbers to give us uh, give rise to a debate. Many of the people who migrated to these jobs in North Carolina, South Carolina, and, and, and even farther deeper into the South were white women. And oftentimes they were single women. There was a huge debate in the in, 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 the, in the denomination about the propriety of sending white women into these places, and above all, sending white single women into these places. And by and large, the answer was, well, let's do it. And so you have a story, there's a whole story of literature now developing on this about these white women, very often single women, who were very active in educational efforts uh, in, on the part of the black population in the, in the South. <clears throat> Let me add, I haven't talked about it at all, and I'm not going to go into it in great detail as I go along, but running through all of this is a kind of just beneath the surface issue of sexuality and sexual relations between the races. Uh, there is a, there is a, there is a, you might say at the core of racism is a fear about race mixing in that way. So the sort of the background to this discussion of the propriety of sending white women to teach blacks is, is that issue. <clears throat> the final thing I want to talk, I promised you three points. Here comes the third one. The final thing I want to talk is the talk about is the beginning, again among whites in the North, the beginning, starting in the early 1900s, not before, of signs of unease about segregation. Unease, which gradually, all too gradually, begins to turn into active opposition. By the way, I hope those of you who think about these things, and I'm guessing from this call, this group, there's a lot of people who think about these things seriously. What, what I'm talking about here in this whole set of series of presentations is a kind of study in social change, how social change happens. It's very, in this, this version of the story is very complicated. In the early 1900s, among some white Presbyterians and other, by the way, mainline Protestants, they're just, oftentimes the story is almost indistinguishable from one to the next, the Methodists, uh, and particularly three or four bodies, the Methodists, Methodists, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, and the Congregationalists. Not so much the Lutherans, uh, others are kind of marginal. Those four kind of are constantly at working at this project, collaborating with one another. Signs of opposition. The signs of opposition come about in two ways. And one is the theological seminaries. Theological seminaries. Now I'm gonna make a statement here which is gonna sound like a special pleading coming from an academic, but I really think it's true. Uh, 
I think one of the most important functions of academic institutions is to be incubators of ideas that are not particularly appealing in the wider society. Let me say that again. One of the most important uh, services that is provided by academic institutions when they're given any kind of freedom is that they become incubators of, for ideas that, uh, th that are, shall we say, less, less appealing to the wider society. Historically, they've played that role it, it, churches play that role to be sure, but academic institutions also play that role in a different way. And it's striking to me that it was in particular in theological seminaries, not all, but some theological seminaries in the period I'm talking about, the early 1900s and even more into the 20s and 30s, where you begin to get rather serious questioning of the propriety of segregation. Let me say that again propriety of segregation. We, we might, from our point of view, we would say, well, of course it's wrong, or of course it's problematic. Well, of course, it's not so obvious to many people at the time. Indeed, for many people, it's obviously the right thing. But there is questioning that goes on, and it primarily takes two forms. One is the social gospel. The social gospel, uh, you've heard about the social gospel, and if you are going to think about this issue, this topic that I'm discussing here, it's an important part of the topic because, among other things, it was one of the resources that gave rise to Martin Luther King Jr. You know, when he went to seminary, this was one of the things that he studied, drew upon, and I think in part went to graduate school where he did because he was interested in that, in that strain of this, uh, uh, of, of Christian theology. And above all, the social gospel is about this. It's about, you know, we hear about it a lot, fortunately, in the, in the pulpit at Lewinsville, social justice, over and over and over again. The social gospel arose in part out of the, out of the, out of the worry that the, 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 the Protestant theology in the, in, the, in the period leading up to the emergence of the social gospel was all too focused on individual salvation without concern about uh, without concern about social institutions and the reform of social institutions. Social gospel and something else, its successor, Protestant neo-orthodoxy. Protestant neo-orthodoxy represented by, above all, the, the Niebuhr brothers, Reinhold Niebuhr and Richard Niebuhr, uh, but there were others uh, who were kind of a, a sort of revised version of the social gospel, a social gospel with a more, with a more theologically complicated uh, 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 foundation to it. You know, for all of those people, the idea was this, and at Lewinsville, we can take this for granted, but I, I, I want to stress it is not taken for granted to, to, to this day in much of Christendom. The, so the gospel has political implications. The gospel has implications for the, stru the right structuring of society. That's the, that's the key theme. Well, once you start thinking in those terms, it doesn't take much uh, sort of reflection to begin to think, well, now, wait a minute, maybe this segregation thing is problematic. And by the way, when the, when, the, when the white churches began speaking in these terms, their clergy began speaking in these terms, many of the leaders of the, of the black church said, of course, we've been talking about this for a long time. So there was a kind of convergence there. The other thing which, which fed into a kind of, and by the way, let me just say one thing about it. the most important statement I have ever read on this topic is in a book published in the mid 1930s by Richard Niebuhr, not Reinhold Niebuhr, but Richard Niebuhr. And it's called the social sources of denominationalism. It's in some respects, it's kind of an angry book. It's, it's a sort of sociological laying out of the sources of denominationalism, which he says are primarily social and cultural, not theological. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's his position. But he's got a chapter on the, uh, on the segregated church, which is just an angry screed against segregation in the life of the church. He says, nothing reveals more clearly the betrayal of the gospel in American life than the fact that we've got all this segregation in church life. Now that's in the 1930s, uh, well before big changes take place in American society on this, on this topic. The other source uh, of, uh, shall we say, critical thinking about segregation is the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement is coming into its own in this period. The Federal Council of Churches was created in 1908. Eventually, that was to lead to the creation of the National Council of Churches. And then globally, there's all that activity, which eventually gives rise to the World Council of Churches. But let me say, even before that, there is something very, uh, you might say, basic going on, which is ministerial associations are created. Ministerial associations are created where clergy of different kinds come together and try to work together on, on cooperative projects. 
I mentioned that because Reinhold Niebuhr, who's not a Presbyterian, but very much a kind of reformed figure, says that one of the main sources of his awakening on the topic of race was the Ministerial Association in Detroit, Michigan, where he was briefly a pastor. He said, and the, why was that? Because they, it had, they had black pastors there. Black pastors and white pastors began to deal with one another, you might say, on a, on a somewhat equal level. I'm sure it's not, was not literally equal. And Detroit in the 1920s was really a tough place to be with regard to race relations because race was intertwined with industrial struggles. And eventually, Reinhold Niebuhr becomes the chairman of the Mayor's Council on Race Relations, which exists in the 1920s and 30s. But he attributes his sort of awakening to simply a face-to-face -face encounter with these. And this is long before he becomes a, a really famous a theologian and goes to Union Seminary and, and, and teaches and so forth. He's a pastor in a church, working, you might say, with the practical problems of that, uh, of that community and has to deal directly with black pastors who are talking about their churches and their problems. The larger issue is this, when the Federal Council of Churches was created, the black denominations become charter members of the Federal Council. Now, why is that important? That's the first time in the history of this long problem where black leaders of independent black organizations are, if you will, on a par with whites in, 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 in thinking about uh, the work of the church in, in American society. And by the way, let me just add, the world ecumenical movement provides another layer here because in those global bodies, you're suddenly beginning to confront, it takes a while for it to happen, representatives of churches that were created under colonization. And you start getting black faces, brown faces and so forth sort of at the, at, 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 at the council table and uh, sort of conversations are going on there about racism as a, as a global issue. Now, I'm about done, but there's a very important step that I have to introduce here. I hope you're all with me. After all that, the only thing that happened for the longest time was the following. You look at it and you think, why couldn't there be more action? Why? Hardly anything happened except Race Relations Sunday. The Federal Council of Churches got its member denominations to have this event once a year in which there was a Sunday set aside in, in, in worship for uh, discussion of race relations. And I kid you not, people think that that actually was important in getting people in the pew to begin thinking about this segregation thing as a problem. That was in the 1920s, however, and there was very little action for a long, long time. I want to say, therefore, the following. I'm about to talk about how desegregation becomes a live topic in American public life. You cannot say that the church has played a leadership role in bringing that about. You cannot say that. I'm going to talk next week about a time when they did play a somewhat of a leadership role, but not in this whole long period. There were people thinking about the problem, writing books about the problem, but that's about all that happened, except for Race Relations Sunday. That's something, but boy, that's not exactly cutting edge. But then something does happen. And here's the way it happens. In the aftermath of World War II, political leaders at the federal level, at the federal level of a couple of different kinds, take action, take decisive action to begin bringing about uh, the desegregation of American life, at least at the public level. One is a man whose performance on this topic I've come to respect more and more the more I've read about it, and that's Harry Truman. Uh, Harry Truman was responsible for, first of all, initiating a conversation with Congress about desegregating the civil service and the military in the aftermath of the Second World War. Now, we've got military people on this call, and I assure you, just, just that's, you can imagine the, the shockwave that that began to, uh, began to produce. There was vigorous opposition in the, in the Senate. He wanted the action that uh, uh, he felt needed to be taken, above all, with respect to desegregation of the military. And by the way, this was a result of his observing the, the role that black uh, 
soldiers had played in the First World War and the Second World War. He thought they played a very important contribution to the, to the well-being of the nation, and it was time to address this issue. He was unable to get any kind of serious action in the Senate, and so he did it by executive order. The desegregation of the military began as a result of a, an executive order by the, uh, the president which met with enormous opposition and led to, you've heard of Thom, 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 can I say it? So, Thom, Sir, Strom Thurmond. Can you say that three times? Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond's uh, departure of the, from, the, from the party to create the Dixiecrats, which almost caught, tr cost Truman the election, but it didn't. That's the first thing. The second thing was the famous and in some minds, infamous decision of the Supreme Court in 1954, the Brown versus Topeka decision, which basically declared, and this is kind of the opening shot, the first was an executive order, but now you get something even more official, a Supreme Court decision, which says this separate but equal stuff is wrong, it's unconstitutional, it's got to stop with respect to the schools. It sent a shockwave through American politics. There was an immediate declaration on the part of a whole host of uh, Southern senators that this was unconstitutional and that they were going to do everything in their power to mobilize opposition to it, which of course they did. And the result was massive resistance, which extended over decades with all kinds of things. I'll talk more about the resistance that took place. Now, in the middle of all that, and I assure you, I am just about done. In the middle of all that, <clears throat> there is violence. <clears throat> and those of us who, some of us can remember it, especially in Arkansas, several other places, uh, simply with regard to the, 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 the attempt to desegregate the schools following the Supreme Court uh, decision. And this massive resistance campaign, of course, which was mobilized very quickly. Virginia was at the at the forefront, by the way, of mobilizing massive resistance against the uh, against the uh, 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 attempt to desegregate the schools. And because of the violence, it was very clear as the violence began to unfold that, it, that this this was not going to happen. This desegregation of schools was not going to happen unless there was active federal intervention. Now, we know now that there were long conversations that took place in the 1950s in the Eisenhower administration about uh, the need to respond to this. And there was, we also know that there was a lot of resistance to it, and, uh, including Ike himself, who thought the use of force in dealing with this was inappropriate. Eventually, he did take action. But, and by the way, Ike is, a, is also a Presbyterian. We've got another Presbyterian here. I would say a different kind of Presbyterian than than Wilson, but another Presbyterian here who was very reluctant to send those troops. And then we have extending for, and by the way, Stevenson, uh, Democratic candidate for president on the, uh, was no better on this, was uh, the Democratic Party uh, platform in 1956 said, we've got to go slow on this. We can't, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't be too uh, aggressive on this. And then when Kennedy comes in, Kennedy's initial impulse, JFK's initial impulse is to say, we also have got to, got to go slow. We can't have too much violence. Uh, and certainly having the federal government intervene too decisively will, uh, will, will just uh, create more problems. Now, last point. Therefore, it's appropriate to conclude that if something which I'm about to discuss had not happened, that probably would have petered out. I want to suggest to you that the 1954 school desegregation decision probably would have just fallen to the wayside, not ever been implemented, had it not been for the following. And that was the emergence in the mid-1950s, particularly in Montgomery, Alabama, and then extending out of an active resistance rooted in the black church to all of this attempt to maintain segregation. This was a direct frontal assault at a very practical level on segregated, segregation policies led by, of course, this very young black clergyman. He'd barely been in, in the job a couple of years. He'd been in, in graduate school. And you begin to get through the Montgomery bus boycott and then a whole philosophy of resistance begins to emerge that as one historian characterizes, turned the struggle over desegregation into a religious and even a spiritual matter. 
it was like a new second awakening, third great awakening, except it had a, uh, uh, a very, very direct political edge. It was a challenge, a systematic challenge to the laws uh, of segregation in the South, but then of course later more broadly. It developed in the 1950s and then just kept building in its momentum, stronger and stronger. The final thing that happened for this part of my story is the following. King, King in particular, although more broadly, the leadership of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference decided that the appropriate way for them to handle all of the threats they were getting, all of the resistance they were getting was to do the following, to appeal to the white churches. And in his writings in this period, he is appealing to the white churches. By the way, the famous letter from the, Bur from the Birmingham jail comes from precisely this moment appealed to the white churches, which he characterizes as the conscience of the nation. And he appeals to the white churches to do what? Step in and support us. Give us support. And lo and behold, I say lo and behold, given their history, lo and behold, they did. And I'm talking about here the mainline, I'm not talking about anybody else, but the mainline churches, the ones that were most active in the National Council of Churches. They took action, they took direct action, and not only that, but they mobilized their, especially the clergy, but more broadly, the, 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 their congregants in support of three things. One, active, act, 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 supporting the direct action of the civil rights movement. Secondly, the provision of shock troops, if you will, to challenge segregation in the Deep South, the so-called Freedom Summer, which I'll get, get to next time. And finally, above all, to mobilize, this is the, the, the most critical thing they did, was to mobilize support for civil rights legislation, especially the famous Civil Rights Act. And as a result of that, Hubert Humphrey said, I'll just say it again, and I'll talk about it more next time. Hubert Humphrey said the following, if it hadn't been for the churches, and he's talking about the white churches, we would not have gotten that legislation. Now, he was the guy who was shepherding the legislation through Congress. So probably he was in a pretty good position to know about the importance of the role they played. Now, how they did that, all that, that's, that's next week. Uh, I'm tempted to keep on talking, but I'm going to stop right there and hopefully be able uh, uh, to uh, entertain a few questions. Kathy? Yeah, we do have quite a few questions. I think I'm going to try to take them somewhat sequentially, which are somewhat chronologically, some of which probably will fill into next week. All right. Um, so one question is whether segregation was also supported by the black community. Um, and another from probably the same period. Are you saying that most of the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, were founded by northern missionaries? So maybe we can start with those two. Well, uh, the, the the first question I can answer is simply and directly, and I, I think I already said it before, but I want to. Uh, it's terribly important to underscore. Insofar as we have an articulate black voice, it's like anything. You know, not, not everybody is speaking in a way that can be uh, that, that can be discerned by historians. But insofar as we have a record of black voices on the issue of segregation, they didn't like it. Now, in a, in a very important debate that took place, place in, the, in, in the early 20th century, uh, there was a debate among black leaders about how to respond to it. And one way was to make your peace with it and try as best as possible to, to, to work within it. The, others, the other response was to resist it and criticize it and as much as possible uh, uh, try to uh, uh, undermine it. The first, was translated uh, into that famous Atlanta Compromise, uh, which said, we will accept a subordinate role as long as in return, we get some degree of educational opportunity so that we can at least have the training necessary to perform menial tasks <clears throat> in return for uh, promises that there will be uh, very little violence inflicted on us. That's the Booker T. Washington approach. And then, the other was the NAACP approach, which said right from the start, we have got to take steps uh, through the courts primarily to dismantle this thing, to resist it. 
overwhelmingly, black Presbyterians were in the second camp. So that, that that's a that, that's the first thing. Give me the second question again. Uh, yeah, were most of the HBCUs founded in this way by Northern missionaries? Some were, and some weren't. Uh, uh, but but I would say in in in, in the majority of cases, uh, missionaries and their black allies. It, it, it's always wrong, I think, to say the missionaries did it. Uh, uh, denominations, mainline denominations, and their black allies played a very significant role in shaping many of those institutions, not all of them. Howard, for example, has a somewhat different history. But so many of them came from uh, some combination of those two forces. Got it. Okay, I'm going to skip over one about liberation theology and Korean Minyoung theology, which um, recognizes that that might be a little bit later or might come up later. And I'm going to come down to... Do we know anything about how people at LPC responded to segregation and the movement for desegregation? You know, I have not been able to, to discover anything about that at all. Uh, as I told you last time, Roland, in his history, alludes to a controversy that developed in Lewinsville Church between slave owners and those who were not. Uh, and that pertained uh, both to the propriety of slavery as an institution, but also to the role of uh, 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 in how to respond to the to the uh, movement out of uh, the Union by uh, the Confederate States and also the formation of this Confederate uh, uh, denomination. So there was a division in the church on all of those issues. That is, and I think Roland and I've talked to him about this has got a pretty good. Uh, uh, basis for saying those things. But about this period of segregation, to my knowledge, Kathy, I don't have any knowledge of it. And I think it, it's, it's an important question, but I just, I don't know uh, what, what, what the story is. Got it. Okay. I think that that may be where we need to end for the moment. We have some thank yous here um, from several people for sort of putting this picture together. Interesting note from Siobhan that um, some of the schools in the South were also established by Jewish leaders so that we do have that. Um, yep, yep, that's also right. Also, not a Christian effort. Um, many of them sort of seen as fin finishing school. So I think we might end there. Do you want to tell us about what next week will be? Yes, and what's then... coming next week? I'm going to talk next week about the period of desegregation, which is the story of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I've already, you, you, you got a preview of what's coming there. It's a very important part of this story, uh, but I'm, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will end next week uh, by talking about the emergence of black power and black theology, which is a phenomenon, a new phenomenon really, uh, of, the, of the late 1960s. So all of you have a good week. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, everybody. We will see you next week. Bye.